There's no more time. Now, no. She's not woken up on her own. Despite Ida's spread to all corners of the system, there are no active, infected characters right now. So all that's left as an outlet to experience the world and interact with the players is through a player character. There's this unanswered question why Ida never infects monsters like the data bugs did in Sign, the core games at Legend of the Twilight, only players. Thematically wise, monsters don't have anything that's not already coded into the game, thus does not interest them like the epitaph and humanity in general do. Story-wise, they were meant to be in the original raft that was turned into the GU novels, but were omitted mainly because they didn't fit the thematic, and probably would have added a few pointless mechanics. Would have explained the inclusion of Avatar Awakening if they could only be defeated through using it in Redemption, but that would have been late to put it in, considering we're approaching the end game as it is. There would have been too little time to play with it. In contrast, though, Redemption ends up feeling a bit empty due to lack of content. We get a few pieces of email exposition, Yara's focusing on how he's known Ovan from the old days, and how he's suddenly changed. You changed, man. You used to be cool. Which again brings things in conflict with Roots. Though not for the better this time, I will admit. Possibly could be backstory for both, and his splintering of their friendship made Yara endeavor to find out what's wrong. But still, something not explored. More importantly, Pi finds an Ida signal originating from Bragapona, and Bo encounters it, or rather, her. Which, unknowing of the danger, asks Ida to party with him. By the time Haseo and Pi get there, it's far too late. Ida airy hacked them away. Fortunately, we can use data search to find the tear and follow them into the outer dungeons, only to find them gone completely. Whoops. Pi returns to the Serpent of Lore to monitor areas, as Gaspar tips us off to the rumors board, learning Ida's been taking Ina for a joy ride far longer than Ovan thought. With it being the only lead, we track down the poster within the game itself on Bragapona, who acts like an asshole, not giving up any details. Gee, it's as if the game was trying to pat itself out from poor pacing with the scenes earlier and is now lacking in content. Well, it turns out I was wrong about Pyrrhus doing nothing else this volume aside from be part of Natsume's exposition, having seen Aina and her disappearing trick at... Thanks, Pyrrhus! Again, this is why I like Pyrrhus in GU. Said Lord Partisan doesn't find her on his initial perusal with us, but that's why we have area hacking giving us the second dungeon in a row with bullshit teleporter mazes, which does have the pair at its end. Hatred. Love. Joy. Sadness. Sakubo. Why, when you are only one, are you also two? I guess that's the curiosity that directed Ida back to Sakubo a second time. That duality which defies explanation from conventional wisdom. And Terrace invites us on the Lawless Fort quest, which is this game's PKer's Paradise quest, revealing that this is an elimination event that's part of entry into the chaotic PKs. Hunters are sent after them, and the survivors led into the tournament that determines the list. Hello, would-be chaotics! We shall be your executioners for the evening! Word of advice! Run! They are, of course, too stupid to recognize the terror of death, even though they are all chaotic PKs we've encountered before that have fallen off the blacklist. At least until we get down to the last team. It's Negimaru. Again. As stated last game, his team fell apart after losing repeatedly to a Seo, and he's completely lost track of them. Trying to become a chaotic to get enough recognition in their circles they would try and make contact with him, so he could be seen as worthy to be around them. And it's what drives him on, even as his underlings leave him. 
but another exchange is held off as Grain shows up. The larger man expositing through grunts that he was feeling just as insecure about things as he was, showing that though they met over ridiculous circumstances and assail and accost other players, they're legitimately friends. Of course, they team up to try and still get into the chaotic tournament, but it's Haseo they are facing. Do you expect any other outcome than their loss? But, sure enough, Antares saw what the two were going through, and set this all up so they'd get back together. Aww. Mm. Thanks. He, he talked! Well, you were going to be paying the voice actor anyways. Might as well have him actually say something. The goblins are back. Again. This time challenging us to a race. Around a circular map, with us needing to keep ahead of each of the goblins in turn for five total laps. Fortunately, there are masses of chim, and my tires are advanced enough to give great traction. Time to think of it. Form change, power surpassing normal mortals, enemy trying to suppress and corrupt people, social Darwinism, card games, technological bike, put a helmet styled after skate on him, and Ryo Masaki is a common rider. For the love of sanity, someone write that! For winning and ending the goblin threat permanently, we get a stat book, and the demon safe shoes. The demon safe shoes are one of two items that can turn off battle encounters, meaning you could just walk straight past monsters without invoking battle. The other is an item customization accessory you could have already gotten if you mastered the bike quests. Oops. Pi calls us to Raven, as Ovan finds the Ida possessed Ina, lamenting his loss of hope once more that she could have gotten better on her own. The last resort. No, I guess this was the only resort right from the start. In Raven, the prophecy and the relevance to the world's lore is discussed for anyone that's not immersed themselves in the series, once more showing how each entry can be essentially standalone only for Ovan to call and call them out, giving his location. We go to it, area hacking into an outer dungeon, and area hack from that into a creator's room, where he and Ina await. So, how do you free the Lost Ones? When you escaped the Ida server, when you removed the cause of the Ida server, the consciousness of the Lost Ones came back. Meaning, it's as he said before. Kill the Ida Infection, kill Triedge, kill him. Destroy me! Devour me! Tear me to bits! Come, Maseo. Use your avatar. The one that's devoured seven of the eight. Now, so that I can never revive again. To bring Shino back. You must devour me entirely! So, it's rematch time against Corbinic, and dear god, the madness is spreading! Erm, um, I mean, the Triedge Ida is preparing to release more spawn, likely a metaphysical manifestation of the Ida seeds we'd seen Zakaki utilizing to infect others. Fine. I'll do it. If that's what you really want. Battle with Corbinic isn't much different than it was before, but that massive cannon tumor arm permits a few more attacks along its motif, including what is probably the most physical, you know what I mean, of the data drain castings. But of course, as the final piece of the rebirth is removed, well, the rebirth begins. Corbinic's a failsafe for the world, triggering a system-wide reset that can remove aberrant and malfunctioning programming. We saw that in the core games, at least when Aura got control over it. The remade Korbnik was meant to serve the same function, but Ovan couldn't trigger it, because of his eye infection rendering him incapable, or some other reason, we've never exactly gotten a straight explanation. As the system destabilizes, everyone but Haseo is forcibly logged out, Ovan espousing to Haseo about Aina, his search for a less extreme solution that fell apart with Shida's PKing. Since then, he's simply been taking a long, thoroughly plotted out gamble. But if it works, all malignant Ida will be wiped out at its source. His entire plan being to develop some entity that could succeed in triggering the rebirth. 
Azure Kite failed to do so. The Key of Twilight wasn't in the world. He was not able to ask Ulra to save them. So, he turned to the phases of the Cursed Wave. And because of their relation in the cycle of life, death was the only force capable of bringing about the end goal. And the cost of himself. That is why I chose you. Why I protected you. Why I raised you like I did. <sighs> you responded better than I could have dreamed. Thank you, Aseo. But the journey he's been on? Well, he doesn't accept that. An explanation and his acceptance of blame is not enough. How many have grieved? How many have suffered? You stepped on so many people just so that you could achieve your self-serving dream! No one has that right! Everybody grieves! Everybody suffers! Everybody has truths they want to ignore! You are not special! You're just like everyone else! Oh, on! But unlike everyone else, he's now been given the means to set it all right. Haseo, there's something I need to tell you. I have found the key of twilight. And he's given it to Haseo. Ovan collapses, clutching the Ida infected Ina to him as his player character breaks down. Wake up, Ina! The rebirth begins, cascading through the system, Ovan's last moments of consciousness allowing him to see... he succeeded. Ida's deleted, and all but the lost ones given their freedom to return to their bodies. But it's not without its unintended casualties. Rio, as he was at the epicenter of the rebirth, has had his PC trashed and his consciousness once more ripped from his body. With his character breaking down, it's threatened to be lost. If it weren't for the intervention of an entity as old as the world itself. He's picked up, but the mental trauma has left him in bad shape, not understanding this ending to everything. What was the point of all this? Everything I've done. Everything I've been through. But to possibly come back, he has to confront and reconcile, just, who is Haseo? Who is Ryo Masaki? And the answer can be found in the actions he's taken over the series. You see, back then, back then I thought that was fine. But, but then, at some point it all changed. They became... Something important to me. And he finds the reason to come back was the bonds he's forged. They're all still waiting for me. That's... that's why... I'm here. And as such, he's confronted with a familiar face. Ah, uh, yes. I found you. Oh. Who are you? So that's your answer, huh? <laughs> what a moron! And what this has ultimately been leading to, since the second he stepped back into the world. Can you recognize yourself? The one who you once were? If there's one thing I've stressed that seems the least relevant to everything, it is Ryo Masaki's relation to who he was in R1. It shouldn't matter, right? He doesn't remember that. And it's obvious if Skate gave it back to him, it didn't matter, right? Well, this is the moment it does. This entity isn't Skate. It's Sora. Everything that was that twin blade that never came back to Rio when he woke up from the second network crisis is standing right before him. And he challenges him that the life and path he'll choose is not an easy one. It's a pain, you know. Tough. Harsh! Are you saying you'll still go down that road? My mind's made up. <laughs> so then, I guess you don't need me anymore. No, I'm not letting you go. I said I'd see things through. 
So come on. I'm taking you with me. Hey. You are me. And with that revelation, after seven years, the missing piece of himself is finally fully returned. Ryo Masaki is whole once again, allowing him apotheosis. This is the Axth form, the job extension surpassing the system, the proof of Haseo's resolve to live. Now, longtime viewers of the show should remember my deconstruction of Lightning Returns, and that near its end, there is a scene similar to this. As you can probably tell, it's the Fabio Nova Crystallis, after all. The scene backfired, as it was there solely to justify the Lumina nonsense without regards to Lightning's character and the themes and elements of the greater narrative, inept as it was. The repercussions of that revelation with what she had done, serving as yet more character assassination. The entire scene coming off as blatant emotional manipulation to keep Lightning from doing the noble thing, sacrificing herself for others. The people she has met on her journey even if it was part of Bunavelsa's plan. Though, all three of the Thirteen's end bosses' plans hinge on the heroes being informed of their end goal and still working to do exactly what the villain says, so it's consistent. The Rebellion's coming off as slapping someone for telling you to make them a sandwich, and then making them the sandwich. But it's still better than your hero intentionally being led to abandon their duties for shallow, petty, selfish reasons. Their decision ultimately won that would lead to dooming every sentient being ever known to exist in their world. This is, of course, before the game pulled yet another deus ex machina out of its ass to solve everyone's problems. But for comparison, there's no thought. There's no introspection, reflection on her actions, revelation or epiphany. Lightning is led by her nose to a conclusion by someone else that is anathema to who she is. The resulting reaction which prompts the reintegration, an emotional outburst that is far out of place. And that being what causes it is so ridiculously shallow, as there's no shown reason why she would have cast out a part of herself. The resulting fridge logic, that Lightning would have done every awful thing Lumina did if given the chance, is abhorrent and contradicts what's been shown earlier. It's ultimately the final piece in her devolution from a stoic but driven and understandable heroine into everything that is wrong with not only a protagonist, but the caricature female leads have begun to be reduced to. And yes, that's mostly why I skipped past in the final part of the review. It was just more of what I had already said in the preceding hours I had talked about it. Whereas in Redemption with Haseo, we have a look back on the choices made by the character, after he's forced to do what Ovan asks in order to achieve his goal in saving everyone. He questions his purpose, his journey, his values, how they've changed by the events they've experienced and grown better, realized in a moment when they have lost themselves, concluding with after finding that reason to go on again through that reflection, they are confronted with a shadow of themselves that they have likewise lost, who challenges the path they are setting themselves on, challenges them as a person, if that's what they truly want, which is reaffirmed, and their reunion into a single entity, symbolic of Aseo accepting who he is, who he's been, and who he wishes to be, all while he's struggling to return to those important to him. All of that feeds into the core story, the themes and elements of the narrative, instead of being completely superfluous to such. It works because it's been built to throughout his character arc, and the nuances we've seen and been privy to throughout the last 60 hours. Helped because he's always been shown in the games as a person, someone we can empathize and connect with and relate to, that makes us invested and able to understand and root for on more than superficial levels. And all of it makes sense, both in the story and for who they are. None of that is present in that scene in Lightning Returns, or the Greater Thirteen Trilogy. 
Anyways, I have mixed feelings about X form. It's a stark contrast from the previous forms, but there's a lot to like about it. Aside from a pair of stupid ass accessories that hang off of his waist. Seriously, what is with that? The extension grants Haseo the dual gunner class, one that was removed from the initial game. It's a close to mid-range gunnery class, able to strike rapidly via firing a multitude of bullets, but require moments to reload, as the number of shots that can be fired in succession is limited. It also allows you to chain skill triggers, doing one of the other three, followed by a dual gun shot. Dual guns also have their own skill trigger, the ability Justice, which is not upgradable in any respect. And we also gain the ability to dash around opponents by tapping Circle. It's a pity, then, that aside from the final endgame, we are completely done with pretty much everything. x form is completely broken, but there's barely anything left to use it with. Especially with how I play the game, and have already hit the 140s in level. I think it would have been really interesting that, as a completely completed the game bonus, that x form could be exportable back to Rebirth allowing the dual guns available immediately, and the latter job extension events just re-unlocking the broadswords and scythes. But that would probably have screwed with the cinematics and whatnot. Food for thought. As Haseo leaves the Restoration Chamber, he is greeted by the Streets of the World's unofficial server. Welcome to the Net Slum. Yes, Net Slum is now a city on the back of a digital sea turtle. His name is Tartarga, by the way. If you think you recognize the name... It's that of Netslum's caretaker from the core games. He was reformatted in R2 to unbind the server from the normal respects of the game, and thus hosts its chief resident, responsible for fixing Haseo up and giving him his new form, Zelkova. Okay, it's finally time to discuss this. Who is Zelkova? I don't know. Seriously, no one knows. Zelkova has never been given a real-life identity. But he claims Netslum is his home. Which builds a different context depending on how you look at it. Is he a relation of Helba's? Is he Helba? Is he Bith the Black? Or, because of evidence provided, is he an artificial intelligence? I actually lean towards that last one quite a bit. Despite being PK'd by an Ida infected player, Zelkova is the only person to not be rendered a lost one by such that doesn't have an epitaph. Hell, in the novelization, it is heavily, and I do mean heavily implied, that Zelkova is an AI, one of the world's many vagrants that can assume the form of a proper player character. Though, in this novel, so is Gobby, and Gobby is confirmed to have a human identity in the games. He's actually a retired professor of cultural anthropology, which just gels so well in hindsight. But aside from that, all the other evidence to Zalkova's identity is circumstantial and applies to the other options. He has an intimate understanding of the world, his equipment and actions hold multiple references to the world's lore, and has an intuitive understanding of how to manipulate its data in both subtle and non-subtle ways. His ability to manipulate data of the epitaph he sees, something even CC Corp's best cannot do, can draw support for any of these interpretations. It's really unfortunate we have absolutely no definite clues to his identity. Hell, Helba at least has the theory about her identity being Kaoru Saba, capable of being supported due to the circumstances in Mutation and Liminality Episode 2, seeking up the disappearances and the related actor illusions. But Zelkova... We've got nothing concrete. Anyways, Natslum is more than capable of weathering the after-effects of the rebirth, the other users there as well. The weight of Ovan's plan finally hitting him. The game seems to begin wrapping up, telling of how the rebirth affected the rest of the network, and the lost ones slowly returning to their bodies. Sirius sends us an email telling of his recovery, while CC Corp of course lays the blame solely at Ovan's feet, rendering him the scapegoat in the whole matter. Because no one would believe the most severe and significant Ida attacks were in fact perpetrated by a 12 year old bastard with a COD complex trying to make everyone his slaves that the company turned control of their game over to. As showcased in a later news article where Masato's identity has been revealed to the public and arrest warrants issued. However, this is all far from over. Yada calling Haseo to the Morgu Barrow Wall, 
as everyone has forgotten a danger that rests from creating a key of twilight. And I told you all of this danger back when I reviewed Roots. But the terminal disc prophesizes what happens when you unite the phases of the cursed wave into one entity. You create a power that diverges from the true limits of the world. Not the one CC Corp limits players to, but the one that defies the AI administrator and her laws. For the rebirth has given new life to the anti-existence. Kubia has returned. And this is the ultimate unintended consequence of Ovan's actions. He had no way of knowing this was going to happen. And the only ones that had an idea it could were either one, dead in the case of June, two, lost ones with zero capability of recovery, or three, flat out insane. So yes, this is his fault. But because he's lost himself, unlike the other sins he's done his best to atone for, this one he can't. But it can also be seen as the sin of everyone seeking a solution that, well, just got screwed over in one way or another to only have that final resort. Which has inevitably made everything worse. As the rebirth cascaded through the entire internet to remove the corruption of Ida, Kubia can flood and contaminate those sections as well. It's Gomorrah's eating and corrupting anything and everything until it can remove the abnormalities it's now detected. Meaning it is infinitely more powerful than when Kites and Black Rose last fought it, and that took the destruction of the bracelet to destabilize its existence. And with the Lost Ones still waking up, they have to, at the very least, keep it at bay. Yada spills he was a wise man at this point, having fought Kubia before, so it's time to plan their counterattack. I will not allow the world to be destroyed. And finally, we add the last Epitaph user we're capable of collecting to our party. Kobia's effects are seen immediately in a more hostile form, taking down high-speed forms of transit and putting nuclear plants in the meltdown ranges as its Gomorrah's swarm pass through the network. But there are still more consequences on top of that, as Aina contacts Haseo. And she blames him, having, through the network consciousness of Ida, been able to see snippets of his actions. So I don't understand! Why didn't you save him? It's clearly the lashing out of a girl in pain that so much horrible events have been perpetrated just for her to live again. And it's why, despite its flaws, I still really like this entry. This is something so few series do. Show the fallout of defeating the ultimate villain of the piece when said villain is not actually evil. And as to why I feel that is so. Because he has shown more. That there's regrets in having needed to take things that far. You understand why he did what he did. And actually get to see and interact with the person he did this all for. It's not just a final battle with them and shove off for the epilogue. The story continues after that to show its impact and effect. You know, I can name series where we are supposed to be sympathetic to the villain or ally turn villain that make them completely unsympathetic to their final appearance, as the abhorrent things they do are never resolved nor reconciled, continuing onwards into the series' conclusion, never sure to pay for their actions, never regretting them, never attempting to put them right, and they are automatically forgiven by those they have harmed the worst, and the audience is supposed to do the same without any reason given to justify it. Low Fanging Fruit is obviously Naruto again with Sasuke Uchiha, but this goes a lot wider than that. Multiple Gundam series, Code Geass, Giver, Bleach, Yu-Gi-Oh, Digimon, Slayers, Kamen Rider, so many series fall prey to this. I'd cite Western examples, but I don't watch a lot of TV these days. And unlike them, we are shown in actual conflict in reconciling those views with what the man's friends have known and experienced, and whether, with understanding of them, can they forgive him, even as they deal with the mess he is ultimately the cause of creating. It's uncertain. It's gray. There isn't an immediate right answer. And the Seo and the rest don't just automatically forgive him. He is made to pay through being sent to what is effectively purgatory, and his name slandered for the whole role he had to take in resolving the whole item mess, when most of that was not actually his fault. 
but we are shown a real reason why he would bear through it, and not for some abstract reason such as revenge or to set the souls of the dead to peace, but to rescue the only damn thing he cherishes in his damn life. Again, the reason I cannot see him ultimately as the villain, even though that is his role in the story. It's more complex than that, and you can see other good people making the same sacrifices he put himself through, which is in stark contrast to what is expected. But Kubia's attack begins, destabilizing the world's servers as its Gamoras begin to flood, overload, and eat its data. Bo tipping us off to Aina being prevalent on one of the first assaults, a sailing company going to rescue her. They succeed, but it's shown Aina's outburst is part of the beginnings of her own cycle of grief, not caring if the world is destroyed if her brother isn't there to share it with her. And you can understand why. But then she crosses the line, saying she would have preferred it had Ovan done nothing, ignoring the truth of his pain, and everyone else is suffering from the various acts of Ida, because she thinks her pain is special. And it's, surprisingly, Bo that refutes that, standing up to her. As though he struggles to speak the words, this is Haseo's influence, and what Saku had thought would destroy her, coming to the fore. Bo's found the confidence within himself. And with Haseo stating what Ovan wanted more than anything else... Ovan wanted to save you. Who will believe in him if not you? Ovan... Desperately wanted you to live. Aina finally allows herself to mourn her loss. As there's little chance right now that Ovan can return. And that's going to lead to a number of problems as we finally close out Redemption and our look at the GU Trilogy. Next time.